years. Thank you, Joe. Uh, and thanks everybody for attending today to hear about the Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development Study. We are going to be talking with you about the design of the study and how we think the data can be used to contribute to our understanding of adolescent mental health. Uh, I'm going to start out the presentation today and then what I will be doing is turning things over about halfway through to Bill and we'll, we'll have a little bit of a transition in the topics that we present. So now I am just figuring out how to advance my slide. Okay. Right, you should be able to do it. Yeah, it didn't. Uh, you want to use that arrow. Oh, okay. All right. Sorry. So our goals today are to provide you with an overview of the study, to show you a, a little bit about the assessment scheme. So how it is that we're collecting the data, what measures we're using at different time points. This is a longitudinal study. We'll introduce you to a few of the findings that have been published to date and synthesized by some of our researchers. And then what we will drill down into, because it's a particular area of expertise that we have, is how the study is poised to answer important questions regarding genetic versus environmental vulnerabilities and cause effect associations that might be described. Let's go to the next one. I'll just say that. Okay, so who are we? Uh, Bill and I are both professors in the Department of Psychology at the University of Minnesota. We co direct one of the data collection sites for ABCD here at the University of Minnesota. We both have PhDs in clinical psychology and we have decades uh, of interest and research experience in the area of adolescent development, particularly brain development, vulnerability to substance use disorders, and mental health. Uh, my area of research interest primarily focuses on the development and neural underpinnings of executive functions and how deviations in typical development might confer vulnerability to pathology. And Bill is the founder and the director of the Minnesota Center for Twin and Family Research. And he's a behavior geneticist who for many years has used twin studies and adoption study methods to look at the interplay between genetic and environmental influences on various outcomes, including mental health outcomes. Okay, um, so just to begin then an overview of the study, I'm gonna focus on the design, the objectives and the sample. All right, so ABCD was initiated by the NIH Collaborative Research Network on Addiction, also abbreviated CRAN. This was a research group that for a number of years investigated the possibility of organizing and conducting a longitudinal study of this type. Various stakeholders were brought into the consultation process as the overarching study was designed. And when ABCD was first funded, the primary NIH stakeholders were the National Institute on Drug, Drug Abuse, NIAAA, and the National Cancer Institute, primarily because those three agencies had an interest in substance use and substance use outcomes, and particularly adolescent initiation and adolescent brain development. But it's now the case that in addition to those three agencies, many other federal collaborators are participating in ABCD. There's a lengthy list here. So uh, you can see that, for instance, the National Institute of Mental Health is involved, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute is involved. And really as ABCD has grown in its scope, as, as we'll tell you about, various agencies within NIH have become increasingly interested and invested in the project. 
So it's meant to be the largest adolescent focused study of brain and behavioral development worldwide. There are other large national studies that are underway in various places around the world, but this one is unique given its adolescent focus and the plan for assessment that will take the sample all the way from pre-adolescence through the adolescent period and into young adulthood. So to date, across performance sites, and there are 21 data collection sites, 11,875 youth have been enrolled. They are all, or were all, ages nine to 10 at enrollment. And again, our goal is to follow them for at least a 10-year period. And I imagine that if funding could be secured, there would be interest in going even longer. The sample of almost 12,000 is comprised of both singleton participants, that is uh, children who were singleton births, as well as twins. And our, in particular here at the University of Minnesota, we have led the effort to recruit twins into this study. For the singleton sample, school-based recruitment was the primary means of ascertaining the sample. So um, using epidemiological data that uh, for each site examined the local geography, socioeconomic strata within geographic regions, schools were identified in each location for recruitment and then it was up to the investigators at each site to reach out to those schools and to ask if they would facilitate recruitment from that school. So for an area like we have here in the Twin Cities, which is a large metro area, we had a list initially of something like 40 schools that we were able to contact and attempt to recruit from. So Across the United States, the sample is epidemiologically informed. The goal was to end up with a nationally representative sample. It's not necessarily the case that we completely achieved that in terms of if you were to drill down by geographic region and ethnic ethnicities and socioeconomic strata within each region, um, it doesn't necessarily quite meet the expectations that somebody might have, but it is a, a broad sample. And then for the twin sample, we recruited from birth registries. Four sites within the consortium led the effort to recruit twins. Again, that was an effort that we led here. And then the other three twin sites were the University of Colorado in Boulder, Virginia Commonwealth University, and Washington University in St. Louis. And it's a little over 800 twin pairs within the, the total sample of youth who are enrolled. So um, ABCD involves multimodal neuroimaging. So we bring the kids in for initially for a very lengthy assessment. They're here for basically an entire day. They do a scanning protocol that lasts for about two hours. There's an extensive health and behavioral assessment that takes place, including measures of cognition and emotional health. We measure activities and environment. Novel technologies are used to enable that assessment. So for example, we're now using Fitbits to record activity levels and sleep. There is biosampling. We collect blood and saliva samples to look at pubertal hormones. And then there's a subsampling process for looking at measures that of substance use in the sample. So for example, hair samples collected to look at um, whether there's been any substance exposure. And ABCD operates according to an open science framework where data sharing and collaboration to publish the findings is broadly encouraged. We uh, hope that through this study, we will be able to develop national standards for normal brain development. So it's an amazing benefit to have a sample that is this large to enable that effort. We'd like to understand individual differences as they operate within 
normal developmental trajectories. So for example, if we think about things like cognitive development and emotional development, there are different factors that, that we suspect can impact them, individual differences factors, to enable more adaptive versus less adaptive trajectories. So that's a great area of interest. And then because we have a twin sample, and I should have mentioned too that we're collecting DNA on the participants as well. We will be able to look at the roles of genetic configurations versus environmental factors on development as well as the interactions between the two. It's not a study that's just limited to the psychological domain, although it's probably fair to say that the majority of assessments fall into that category. We do have measures of physical health, activity, sleep quality, uh, exercise. There are blood samples being collected to enable things like cardiovascular risk um, uh, profiles to be ascertained and then examined over time. And we hope that this will allow, this study will allow us to look at the onset and progression of mental disorders, particularly because adolescence is recognized as a period of the lifespan when symptoms begin to emerge. And that's true for symptoms of affective disorder, for acting out behaviors that uh, otherwise might fit the description of externalizing behavior, including substance use and other risk-taking behaviors, and uh, psychosis, should it um, be evident in anyone within the sample, is likely to emerge during this time. I've mentioned substance use a couple of times, and that's an area that's of particular interest to ABCD. So if and how exposure to substances such as alcohol, nicotine, and cannabis affects developmental outcomes. So uh, why now, you might uh, wonder, why is it that we haven't initiated a study of this type prior to this point in time? Why wouldn't we wait a bit longer before we do this? Well, it, it was thought that the time is right because we have as, as we all may be aware of, maturing technology that enables us to do a large-scale study of this type in a reliable manner across multiple sites. Imaging technology has advanced quite a bit, especially within the last decade, to allow multiple imaging modalities to take place in a relatively brief interval of time. So we can look at things like task-based brain responses, we can look at resting state responses, and brain structure all within the same session. Uh, genotyping has become increasingly affordable. And um, as I mentioned, we're able now to add some novel remote technologies to the assessment scheme, which uh, contribute to the efficiency of the study. Our scientific workforce is maturing, um, except for the two of us, of course, uh, who remain young forever. Uh, we are part of a large team, if you cut across ABCD assessment sites, where there are many people with expertise in longitudinal assessment, with interests in the adolescent brain, and with expertise in substance use particularly. And at the same time, we also have a workforce who are trained in advanced computational techniques that would allow a data set of this size and scope to be managed. And finally, it was thought that the cultural time is right because at least here in the United States, we're seeing a number of changes underway with respect to policies surrounding substance use and its availability to youth. The legalization of cannabis as it is kind of advancing across the United States is something that our consortium is quite interested in and interested in leveraging in terms of understanding its impact on youth development. And then, you know, we're at a unique time in history given changing technologies that are impacting youth activities. So screen time is 
at an all time high. I think it's fair to say there's engagement with social media and things like that where understanding the outcomes is important. This slide just kind of gives you a sense of how ABCD is organized. It lists all of the data collection sites in blue. And then we have a coordinating center located at the University of San Diego. So those are the individuals who lead the consortium, who organize the, the structure of different work groups that are in charge of making sure that areas of assessment are progressing well and kind of monitoring the activities at each of the sites. There's a data analytic center which is responsible generally for quality control of the data, preparing the data for sharing and dissemination, and then as I already mentioned we have our federal collaborators. So now I'm going to just shift a little bit and tell you a little bit about the assessment schedule. So ABCD includes assessments at baseline, which has already been completed on the full sample. We're now in our third assessment year, and there's a little bit of variability across the sites because different sites got started and really accelerated their pace of recruitment at slightly different rates. So here, for example, we are just about to begin year three assessments on the sample. So what happens is that there's a baseline assessment that's comprehensive. It includes neuroimaging. Two years later, there's a similar assessment of that type. And then in between, that, that's the plan every two years to have a particularly comprehensive day-long assessment. In between, we do see the, the kids and their families in person every year. The one-year assessments don't include neuroimaging, but they include some other behavioral measures, which I'll show you in a moment. And then every six months, there are phone calls where we check in with the kids around their mental health and substance use primarily. So basically, it's highly frequent contact with the youth and with the families, and at the in-person assessments, both the parents and the youth contribute to the, the data that are being collected. I'll show you the instruments that we use and just tell you in advance that a goal in designing the study, because it's multi-site and large in scope, was to select measures that of course are reliable and valid but that are relatively brief can be administered through automated means so we wanted to minimize experiment or burden for things like data entry and and data quality control at the site level and then to harmonize measures with what we know is going on with other large scale studies of a similar type so this slide illustrates for you the youth protocol, and this is the baseline protocol. And it's organized here by domain of assessment. So for example, we have multiple measures of physical health. We have our biospecimen collections. What I want to particularly call your attention to, because I think many of you are interested in this area, are the mental health assessments. So that's the second column over uh, toward the middle to bottom of the screen. And what we do primarily for our mental health assessment is to rely heavily on the KIDI schedule for affective disorders and schizophrenia, the KSADS interview. It's administered using an iPad. So that's a new iteration in the development of the KSADS. And the KSADS is completed, well, we get information at baseline primarily uh, from the parent, and then the, the children are contributing as well to that assessment. So we also have questionnaire measures of impulsivity, of personality features or, or trait domains like behavioral inhibition and activation, which would include things like reward seeking, sensation seeking, there's a prodromal psychosis scale. And although it might seem that 
a goal here or a, a focus here is on all the things that can go wrong, we're also interested in adaptive behavior. So there's a youth resilience scale as well. And that type of measure allows us to quantify not only symptoms of pathology, but maybe positive factors that might be exerting an adaptive influence on development. Parents, as I said, also contribute to the protocol at baseline and they, uh, as, as they contribute to the mental health assist assessment by describing the symptoms that their children are experiencing. They complete the Achenbach child behavior checklist. We have the general behavior inventory, which measures it, the subtype component that we're using is measuring mania. And um, uh, family history is also something that is ascertained from the parents. And you can see there are other things here as well, like, for example, substance use ratings and, and ratings of the family culture and environment in which the child is living. At the mid-year follow-up, this is the one-year assessment, or I'm sorry, this is these are the phone calls. Um, every six months, the youth is the, the child is the source of the information. And again, the emphasis is on whether or not there's been any initiation of substance use and what type, whether there have been any changes in psychopathology, and then we measure positive affect using a scale from the NIH toolbox. The one year assessment in person includes uh, some repeat assessments from the baseline, like you'll see that the KSADS is administered also at one year. But we've also added a few different measures, for instance, in the cognitive domain that we did not collect at the baseline. So the one year assessment's more limited in scope. It takes about three hours to complete as opposed to a full day and doesn't include neuroimaging. So data from ABCD can be accessed by anybody who is uh, connected, I guess you'd say with an institution that would, um, uh, could kind of oversee and, and monitor data access. ABCD encourages an open science model. And the NIH National Data Archive, ENDA, is where the data are stored. And there are curated data releases which occur annually. There have been two releases so far. The first one was focused on the first half of the baseline sample. And the second one, which was released relatively recently, completed the baseline sample and included part of the one year assessment. So to be able to work with the data and publish the data, it has to be accessed through this means and then there is a faster track available for obtaining the imaging data, but you have to be able to download the full imaging data set and store it and process it more or less on your own. So there have been a few findings published to date. Um, I'm not going to go into all of those and, and there, are, there are some papers that that we have contributed to, others that I'll refer to that have been published by other people affiliated with the study. And generally, the work that is that, that people are doing so far and that I think has a lot of potential for the study has focused on methods development. So in the context of maybe some of the newer measures that we're using, how we can look at the data to understand risk and protective factors, now, just keep in mind, we don't have comprehensive longitudinal data yet, so these analyses are done primarily focusing on the baseline assessment and looking within a single age range, nine to 10 year olds. There have been some attempts to look at brain behavior associations, and I'll show you a little bit of data about substance use in the sample so far. So what I'm going to do is just walk you through a couple of findings that have been synthesized so far and a couple of the published papers. And the first thing I'm going to describe is just descriptive data on suicidal ideation within the baseline cohort. 
So this is child self-report from the KSADS interview. It focuses on the full baseline sample where those data were available. And you'll see from the sample size there that we do have a few missing cases. And what you see graphed here are the percentages of the sample that endorsed various aspects of either self-injurious behavior or suicidal ideation. And it's broken down into present uh, in the last um, you know, several weeks versus past. And one pattern that you'll notice if you just glance through this graph is that the rates of endorsement, first of all, are not zero. So we do have some level of positive endorsement of these behaviors, which is perhaps not a surprise to anybody working in the mental health field. And the endorsements are greater for past versus current ideation. Uh, for example, wishing that, or that you might be better off dead, a, a form of passive ideation is endorsed by nearly 8% of the sample and more so in the past versus the present. Suicide attempts though are, are relatively low. That's, those are the last two uh, bars on the graph. And so it's about, it's less than 1% of the sample endorsing an actual attempt. If we go to the next slide, you can see how this breaks down by sex. And one surprise here, so we have females in blue, males in red, is that across the board, rates of these behaviors are higher in males versus females. And I think at least for us, that, that was somewhat of a surprise, especially with in relation to self injurious behavior, which I think many of us tend to think of as being more common in females, but it, it cuts across all of the domains that were assessed. And if we go to the next slide, you can see this is parent report, also broken down by sex of the child. It tends most of the time, by the way, to be the mother who is the informant, wh whichever parent is, uh, has brought the child in for the assessment. Um, and so here again, you can see, first of all, that there's a pretty high rate of agreement between the parents and the children about the rates of endorsement of, of these various aspects of behavior. But here again, the parents agree that the behavior is more common in males versus females. And if anything, the parental rates of endorsement are slightly higher than the child's rates of endorsement. So just to summarize then, general agreement between parent and child reports, which I think to some extent is, is reassuring that parents are understanding what's going on with their children. It's intriguing that rates are higher in males versus females. And one interest that we have is in being able to follow the sample as they navigate the pubertal transition. I should have mentioned we are also measuring pubertal stage and looking at how these rates change over time and with advancing pubertal development. I think many of us understand, for example, that in females, there's a hypothesis that with increasing pubertal development, rates of depression and perhaps suicidal ideation increase. Uh, there have been some attempts using the baseline data to look at correlates of depressive symptomatology, so not just suicidal behavior, but other aspects. And next, I'm going to show you a, a couple of those papers. So here is data from a paper published this year in JAMA Psychiatry. And this, um, this paper was led by Danny Pine at the National Institutes of Health. They used a portion of the baseline sample and looked at anhedonia within the children, and that was ascertained by um, uh, some of the questionnaire data. And then in the brain, they looked at brain activity associated with performing 
a behavioral task, the mon monetary incentive delay task. This is a reward processing measure where you are generally making decisions in order to obtain monetary rewards. And if somebody is depressed or affectively blunted, in theory, they would show less activation, less responsivity to receiving monetary rewards. And here what they found were multiple brain areas, you can see them highlighted in the graphs, where reactivity, task evoked activity was lower in children with anhedonia. So weaker patterns of act activation throughout the cortex primarily as a function of anhedonia. And so that's something we can follow up on over time to better understand the neural networks that are contributing to that behavior. There have also been, if we go to the next slide, some attempts to look at protective factors. So one of the factors that was examined and, and a paper also published focused on sports involvement. So what was examined in the baseline sample again was the extent to which children in the sample reported that they engaged in team sport activity. And so if you look at the graph that's on the top left hand side, uh, there's uh, no's and yeses, and it doesn't show up quite as well as I might have liked males versus females. The males are the slightly darker bars and females the, the somewhat lighter gray um, to the right. And what you can see, first of all, is just that th there are significant, well, there are a lot of children who are engaging in, in team sports. And what's graphed is CBCL depression symptomatology as a function of sports involvement. So what you can see in the graph is that males who do not engage in team sport activity have higher levels of depressive symptoms than those who do engage in such activity. And for females, it doesn't really make a significant difference whether they do or don't. So what was done in this study was to look at whether or not there might be brain correlates of that association and hippocampal volume was the focus of study. So there was evidence for partial mediation of this association by hippocampal volume, uh, more strongly so in boys. And while this doesn't tell us necessarily that there are cause effect associations here, it nonetheless gives us some hints about something, a behavior that, that may confer something adaptive, especially for boys. And maybe this would be something, for example, that might be recommended to children who are vulnerable to depression that might actually help. Now, of course, we don't know if it's the case that people are self-selecting into activities because of depressive symptoms. Again, something that we could look at as the study progresses. Um, in a moment, I'm gonna turn things over to Bill, but I wanted to just show you what substance use looks like in the sample to date. So in the baseline sample, uh, again, ages nine to 10 years of age, what you can see is that the rate of engaging in substance use is extremely minimal. And the goal of the study, even though kids were not selected this way, was to ascertain a sample that would be largely substance naive. And it's only 21 children of the full 11,875 who report that they have consumed ever a full drink of alcohol or um, an even smaller number who have taken a puff, more than a puff of a cigarette, an e-cigarette, including vaping, and more than a puff of marijuana. And in fact, there are significant numbers of children in the sample at baseline who haven't even heard of these substances. So this means that we are going to be well positioned, if we go to the next slide, to be able to look at pre-morbid vulnerabilities versus exposure effects as the sample ages into substance use. And what Bill is going to talk to you about next is how we have used a technique like this um, in twin studies to understand genetic versus environmental effects on substance use of um, outcomes. <laughs> 
just that slide. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, good to have a chance to chat with you today. So, as Monica pointed out, ABCD is just getting underway, and it's a study that's designed to go for a decade. And you know, one question you might have is, well, what are what might we expect when that decade is concluded about what we may able, be able to learn from ABCD? And one question that's really important is among many hundreds that we could ask, is whether or not marijuana affects the brain of adolescent children in such a way that causes lifetime maladjustment and impairment. And one thing that we could look at is whether or not marijuana use causes cognitive decline over the course of adolescence, which would be unfortunate if it did, because of course these kids are more likely to drop out of school and uh, probably be less productive during the course of their life. What is currently known about the answer to this question? Well, just a quick overview of the literature. The findings so far have been pretty inconsistent. Some studies report IQ effects, others find no effect. Uh, it's not really clear if the use of marijuana during adolescence causes the decline, or if there are other things that could contribute to the decline. For instance, kids coming from low socioeconomic backgrounds are more likely to uh, have less educational opportunities, score lower on IQ tests, then have more exposure to opportunity to use marijuana. Uh, there's a genetic liability to use drugs. Uh, there's a genetic liability that influences cognitive development. If these things are, are going together, then, then uh, and, and, uh, it, it could be the case that it's the liability to uh, <clears throat> have low IQ and to uh, be prone to use drugs that's associated with the IQ decline over the course of adolescence, if there is any. It's not always clear to what degree the effects are attributable to current use versus chronic use. It's not clear if effects are permanent. They could be reversible if kids stop using these drugs. The, most of the work is cross-sectional and correlational. A lot of the studies have very small samples. Uh, they're case control studies, oftentimes using um, kids who, for instance, are in treatment centers versus kids who aren't. And there's a lot of retrospective reporting of use. So we're looking at kids who might be uh, late teens or even young adults and asking them questions about their use of uh, drugs during adolescence, which is subject to various kinds uh, of, of bias. But there are a few uh, studies that have um, perspective protocols uh, and that take assessments of IQ prior to the use of drugs, and they have very interesting kinds of findings. And I just want to talk about two of them. Both of them were published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, one by Meyer et al., which is a prospective study of singleton children um, that shows that adolescent marijuana use is indeed associated with decline in IQ. And another one, a twin study, that indicates that adolescent marijuana use is associated with a decline in IQ, but marijuana is actually not causal. So the, the decline in IQ that's seen can't easily be attributed to the use of marijuana per se. Uh, these two studies highlight the value of ABCD research design because it's perspective and it includes twins and it will kind of uh, take advantage of the best features of both of these studies. Let's just take a second and look at the first study. Uh, this was carried out by investigators at Duke University, led by Afshalon Caspi and Terry Moffat. Uh, this is a study that uh, has capitalized on their longitudinal work in New Zealand and uh, the Dunedin community. Uh, this is a birth cohort, it's a population sample. So these people are selected like ABCD participants to be uh, representative of the population from which they were drawn. Uh, in this project, IQ was assessed at ages uh, 7 and 13, and then much later at age 38 using uh, Wexler individually administered IQ test. And 18% of the sample met criteria for cannabis dependence over the course of the study, and 18% met the criteria for regular use, which meant using four days a week uh, for a year. And these are the results. This is kind of a, a complicated table, but just to like get you oriented to it a little bit. Uh, this part of the table deals with effects that can be contributed to persistence of cannabis dependence. This was a multi-wave study. And so they assess people every few years. And then the question they're asking here is, well, what do the IQs of kids look like if they were only diagnosed cannabis dependence once, or maybe on as many as three waves? And then here we're looking at persistence of regular cannabis use. And again, we're asking 
are these people using cannabis a lot uh, over at one wave, two waves, three waves? Uh, you can see there's a comparison group of never used, never diagnosed, and then people who use but never really seem to have um, a serious problem. And just to kind of take a quick look at the results, if you look here at the persistence of dependence outcomes and you look at the IQs here, these kids looking at the ones that have one diagnosis have an IQ of 96 when they're age 7 to 13 and 94.8 uh, when they're 38. So they're showing a drop in IQ over the course of this long interval. And the effect size is listed here. And what you can see is the effect size gets larger the more diagnoses that um, these people have. So the more persistent the dependence on cannabis, the greater the IQ drop from age uh, around 10 or so, which is the age of the ABCT intake cohort, to age um, 38. If we look at uh, persistence of regular cannabis use, we see the same sort of pattern, IQ dropping and dropping more over the course of time uh, if there's more uh, periods of time over the course of this long longitudinal study uh, where uh, people have used marijuana. One of the interesting things they did, and again, it's very relevant to ABCD, is they were able to examine whether or not it was the use of um, marijuana, in particular during adolescence, that seemed to account for the effects. So this bar here and this bar and this bar show how much the IQ has dropped for people who started using marijuana before age 18. So that's the adolescent onset. And if they started using marijuana later in life, that's this bar. And what you can see is, is that it's the, the kids who started using before 18 who have the substantial drop in IQ. And this is much more so if they were consistently marijuana dependent and were diagnosed as having marijuana dependence on as many as three occasions. Another important question that this study asks is, is there recovery from adolescent um, heavy use? So these, this uh, chart right here shows the results where there was fre frequent cannabis use at age 38. And then there are, th this is for people who had on onset prior to age 18. And what we can see is that their IQ has still dropped uh, when they're using frequent uh, cannabis uh, as adults. But what's interesting here too, is if you look in this box, you can see that even the kids who are infrequently using, they're not kids, they're adults, sorry, but their infrequent use of cannabis at age 38, there's still a substantial drop in IQ based on um, their having used cannabis before the age of 18. If we look on the other side of the figure, what you can see here is that if they had an onset of use after age 18, there really isn't any effect on IQ. And it doesn't matter if they were using cannabis a lot when they were 38 or if they weren't using cannabis a lot at age 38, there's really no effect. So it seems to be if you're using cannabis before the age of 18, there's an effect. And if you stop using it as you get older, that effect persists. So there really isn't recovery from the use of cannabis. So takeaway message from uh, this study is that adolescent use was associated with poor cognitive functioning and decline in IQ. The effects were stronger for persistent use. The effects appeared specific to adolescent onset and didn't vary with the frequency of use at age 38. And these findings are consistent with the possibility that there's a neurotoxic effect. That is that adolescent use of cannabis changes the way the brain works leading to uh, intellectual impairment. However, there are limitations to longitudinal studies like this. Uh, it's certainly the case that marijuana use during adolescence could account for uh, the results that we see, but adolescents who use cannabis differ from those who don't, uh, even if they don't use cannabis. Uh, they're at high genetic risk and high env environmental risk, something I mentioned uh, before, and their IQ might have declined anyway, even if they had never touched cannabis. And there's certainly evidence that uh, poor academic performance uh, precedes cannabis initiation, and it's certainly reasonable to think that low IQ might actually be present before uh, people start using marijuana. You know, we could ask, well, what difference does it make whether marijuana uh, causes a problem uh, in kids' brains and leads to cognitive decline? Because whether it does or doesn't, we're not going to uh, institute policies that open up the doors to adolescent cannabis use. But it does make a difference because kids get access to these substances, they use them inappropriately, uh, 
And how we think about how to help them depends on what the answer to this question is. If the problem is an underlying liability that makes it so uh, they're going to have problems no matter what, targeting an intervention on the use of marijuana isn't gonna make any difference. What we should really be doing is targeting our resources on kids who are high risk to have these sorts of problems. If the problem though really is the consequences of use, then we should target our prevention resources to limit marijuana access and make sure it's hard for them to get it. Because if we can keep them from getting it until they're adults, as this Meyer study shows, then we might expect that the long-term consequences are pretty minimal. And of course, these questions are really important right now because uh, there's a lot of pressure in different states to legalize marijuana and the trend toward legal legalization is definitely moving forward aggressively. So here at the University of Minnesota and the Minnesota uh, Center for Twin and Family Research, we, we did a study of our own twins, which coincidentally uh, we started examining at age 11, same time, about the same age as the uh, ABCD cohort. And we followed them up to age 18, uh, which is about the age at which we might stop following the ABCD cohort. And we had colleagues at the University of Southern California who had a parallel twin study where they also recruited twins at approximately these ages. And here in Minnesota and at USC, uh, we recorded IQ and had a chance to look at how change in IQ varied with marijuana use in the context of a twin sample. So these are questions that we posed in this study. Is adolescent marijuana use associated with poor cognitive functioning? Is it associated with a decline in IQ? Is greater use associated with greater decline in IQ? And are observed effects more likely to reflect the consequences of use or familial confounding factors associated with both low IQ and use that might reflect the underlying liability to use? And then does poor cognitive functioning precede marijuana use, which is I thought an interesting question that we could also ask. This study um, involves two geographically distinct areas, Southern California and Minnesota. We have really large samples of over 3,000 kids. The twins were assessed between ages 9 to 12 and 17 to 20 using individually administered uh, Wexler uh, IQ tests. You can see them listed here. Um, what was interesting about this study that added to what the, was done in the Meyer study and the kind of thing that we can do in ABCD is that it was possible to do a co-twin control analysis. And to get an understanding of what this kind of analysis is like, you consider the fact that we have um, identical twins or so-called monozygotic twins and some of them are discordant for use and discordant for heavy use. So in a twin pair like that, one member of the pair is using uh, marijuana a lot and the other one is abstinent or, or using it much less. And the logic of this design is that uh, identical twins share a common environment that they're reared in uh, and they share uh, DNA in common. Um, and so if there are differences in, in how these twins IQ turns out and one uses marijuana and the other doesn't, then it's a reasonable inference that the reason their IQs differ have to do with the fact that one twin used marijuana and it's not due to some sort of confounding factor uh, like environmental risk or genetic risk. So a way of thinking of this is the IQ of the non-using twin provides an indication of what the cognitive ability of the using twin should be had the using twin not used. So if the using twin shows more IQ decline than the non-using twin, that would help us come to the conclusion that low IQ is a consequence of use. But if the IQs of the twins are the same, so that even the non-using twin shows the same sort of IQ effect, then it's more likely that genetic and familial liability accounts for the IQ uh, decline. So a little bit about these samples. As I mentioned, there were 3,000 kids. Um, you can see here the samples from USC. Um, one of the, the things that you can see here looking at this column, there's actually quite a bit of marijuana use over the course of development between pre-adolescence and adolescence. Another interesting feature of this study is it's mostly non-white. Uh, so this is an urban, largely uh, Hispanic population uh, in Minnesota. Uh, we ended up with fairly similar rates of use, but our sample uh, has a much greater percentage of white kids. Um, these are the results for these two studies. The actual IQ tests are listed here. 
Uh, they're not the same in both studies. So if there's a blank here, it's because that test wasn't administered in that study. These are the results for uh, USC. These are the results for Minnesota. These are the baseline IQs and these are the follow-up IQs. And just to quickly go through the results, uh, for the USC sample at intake, the uh, using kids and the non-using kids have identical IQ. But by age 19, 20 follow-up, you can see the users had a four-point deficit. So these kids who are using are showing the same thing found in the Meyer study, a decline in IQ over the course of adolescence. In Minnesota, uh, however, a, a little bit of a difference that the baseline IQs of um, the kids in Minnesota who use, and this is before they actually use, of course, because this is the baseline, uh, show a two-point deficit in IQ. Uh, but at the age 17 to 19 follow-up, the difference in IQ between the users and the non-users is about six points. So again, we see a decline in kids who use marijuana over the course of adolescence. Um, going back to the Meyer study, it also turned out, even though it wasn't a feature that they focused on in the study, that the IQ of kids in their study were lower uh, among kids who became dependent or who regularly used drugs uh, at the time of the initial assessment at age seven to 13. So they also found a similar effect to what we found here in Minnesota. Here you can see the results for the similarities test, uh, no difference. And the results for block design, matrix reasoning, and picture arrangement also showed no difference. Um, just to plot this so you can see the results graphically, uh, the blue lines here are for Minnesota, the red lines are for USC. And what you can see is the non-using kids in both places, their IQ actually goes up over the course of adolescence. And for the users, their IQ is actually going down over the course of adolescence. Um, <clears throat> these are the results just for Minnesota and just for the vocabulary IQ test. Uh, and here you can see the pattern that we just mentioned uh, with the non-users showing an increase in IQ, the users showing a decrease. Um, <clears throat> One of the things that we looked at is whether or not in uh, the discordant pairs for use, there was an association between discordance for marijuana use and for uh, IQ decline. And we did a statistical analysis of that, uh, which is summarized here. I'm not gonna go into the results, except to say there's no effect. So there's no evidence that um, there was any effect of marijuana that affected uh, the using twin uh, in a way that was different from the non-using twin. And here you can see the results of that lack of ability to find an interaction effect in just the Minnesota sample. You can see the non-using twins, uh, and th these are in pairs now that are discordant. So this twin has a co-twin who's using marijuana. Even though this kid is not using marijuana, his IQ is declining. And the twin who is using marijuana, the IQ is declining too, but at the same rate. Uh, and what you can see though is from what we already told you is shouldn't be a surprise is that the using twin actually starts out with lower IQ to begin with. Um, <clears throat> this, this slide just summarizes the results related to dosing and the big picture conclusion here is that whether you use marijuana more than 30 times or you use it daily, whether you're in the USC sample or the Minnesota sample, it doesn't matter. There's no relationship between how much you use and how much decline you experience in IQ. So there's really not much evidence in this study that um, marijuana use has much of an effect on the IQ decline. So just to summarize the results, use was associated with lower IQ at follow-up, but only on the crystallized Wexler subtest. These results ha held after adjusting for all sorts of confounding factors that we might wonder could affect the results. And they're actually consistent with results from Meyer et al, at least showing that um, we got effects for crystallized IQ and some of the IQ decline was evident prior to any exposure to marijuana. Um, the IQ deficit ranged from four to six points. Uh, heavier use was not associated with a drop in IQ. I uh, already mentioned this. Um, and the evidence did not support the idea that um, marijuana use was causal. So some interesting things about this study is very large sample, uh, geographically diverse, ethnically diverse, uh, and it provided an opportunity to evaluate causal inferences that are logical to make or not because it included this twin sample and allowed us to use this co-twin control design. Uh, 
Importantly, we found, like Meyer did, that those who used marijuana during adolescence showed a decline in IQ. However, our results would differ from the interpretation that many made from their study, because our results show that uh, it's not marijuana use that accounts for the decline. Instead, it's other things that reflect the liability to use that are associated with low IQ that's related to the design. We couldn't identify any specific mechanisms in our study, um, but they could be things like low educational opportunity, uh, kids not being uh, invested in their education in their schools, decreased parental monitoring, these are sorts of things that we would like to follow out, up. And with the large sample in ABCD and the measure of these sorts of things, with ABCD, we should have an opportunity to get a handle on these questions. So overall conclusions, um, adolescents who misuse marijuana have diminished cognitive ability. Uh, the low IQ of the, of the adolescents seems to precede their use. Adolescent marijuana use does not appear to cause IQ decline. There are unidentified family factors that seem to be responsible. Um, and one of the important caveats of uh, what we're showing here is we're just talking about one measure, and that's IQ. And we're just talking about consequences over the course of adolescence. And in ABCD, there are many, many measures of things that uh, are affected, including we have all the MRI scan data uh, and all sorts of measures of mental health uh, and other types of uh, neuropsychological performance and uh, cognitive ability measures and well-being measures and uh, life adjustment measures and these sorts of things. And all of these things may or may not be affected uh, by uh, marijuana use. But the point is with the ABC design, which has its twin sample embedded in it, uh, we're poised to really be able to tease apart how these genetic and environmental effects, some of which are, can be attributed to exposure to marijuana, which is an uh, environmental effect, how it actually affects the brain, overall psychological health uh, and adjustment um, through adolescence. So just to acknowledge the MCTFR staff who helped with this Jackson et al. study, and to remind you that ABCD is a really big collaborative study. Uh, sometimes you look at a picture like that and you think, wow, there's almost as many investigators as there are subjects. Not quite, but there are an awful lot of people working hard on ABCD to make this resource available to uh, the world, really, uh, and to help us get traction on really important questions about adolescent health uh, and development. So that's it for our uh, presentation and be happy to take some questions. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Monica. And we do have a few questions here. If anyone else has a question, please submit them in the chat box and we'll try to squeeze them in here. Um, the first two questions are from Jen and Ali and I'll try to just lump them together. They wanna know, when did this study begin and what was the cost of this study? Well, so the study began about three years ago. That was, uh, th there, there was a, about a year's planning that occurred before data collection actually began, but data collection has been underway for three years. And the cost, it's an expensive study, as you might imagine. Um, Part of what makes it expensive is brain imaging is expensive and a lot of the measures involve intensive use of personnel. Uh, so it's, it's gonna cost a lot. I'm not exactly sure what the annual budget is, but it's uh, probably over 25 million a year spent on this study right now. And it's a 10 year project. So over the course of the 10 years, uh, it's going to be very expensive. And for the project to make any sense, it should really follow these kids up until they're older because it's just an incredible resource. Uh, was, we'll know so much about these people. So it'll probably be more expensive, but we would argue uh, it's worth it. Thank you both. Um, the next two questions I'm kind of gonna, gonna put together here. Um, Peter says, these are pretty small sample sizes for the three waves IQ study. How valid is this result? And Beth says, does your sample include less dense populations such as um, Northern Minnesota, those on reservations, et cetera? Um, sure, so first place the samples are small. They're not that small though. I mean, we're talking about um, between the Meyer study and our USC Minnesota study, there's 4,000 kids involved. However, it is the case that among users, the numbers aren't that great. Uh, 
Uh, and of course, uh, those studies don't involve the kind of intensive measurement that's going on in ABCD. So one, again, one of the things we're looking forward to in ABCD is the ability to flesh out the interesting findings that you see in those other studies. Now, in terms of the Minnesota sample, um, the Minnesota sample is representative of the entire state. And so what we do is we uh, identify all the twins uh, who, for instance, in, in, our, in our project here in Minnesota, who were born uh, 11 years prior to the time we first contacted them. And we can do that in Minnesota because um, the, uh, we had access to state records, the birth certificates, and we could identify all the instances of um, uh, twins being born. And then we followed up and used various resources to track down these families and invite them to participate in the study. And it turns out that um, uh, people in Minnesota generally know about the reputation of the university for twin research. So we have you know, usually a pretty easy time to get people interested in what we're doing. So it is a statewide sample. However, uh, it's not the case that we over uh, sampled people who live throughout the state and uh, certain hard to reach areas or folks on uh, living on reservations and this sort of thing. So, so while it is a rural urban sample, and if you were born in the state of Minnesota and were a twin, and you were born 11 years earlier, you were invited to participate in this study. Uh, there are certainly groups that are not uh, well represented, but they are represented probably at about the rate that you would see in the Minnesota population in general, which if you go back to the time we started this study, which would be about 20 years ago, this was a state that was less ethnically diverse then uh, than it is now, and even now it's not that ethnically diverse. All right, thank you for expanding upon that. Um, Rini asks, and this is a several part question, um, Hispanic kids and IQ tests, are we sure there was no bias in testing? What were the comprehension levels? Was English L1 or L2? Was being an ELL a factor in determining IQ? And were they screened for PTSD or depression beforehand? I know that's a lot. Yeah, it is a lot. Those are all, um, you know, really good questions. And I'm going to uh, apologize that I can't answer them uh, very well, because those, uh, that study was um, carried out by colleagues at the University of Southern California, and I don't know uh, the answers to all those things. I do know that the studies were done uh, in ways where the investigators tried as best they could to take into account cultural differences and to uh, work with the uh, Hispanic community in a way that would uh, <clears throat> be appropriate uh, given those kinds of cultural differences. So for instance, um, <clears throat> they would have used the uh, Spanish versions of uh, assessment instruments and, and working with those families. And I don't know about all the other things that they assess um, besides IQ. Um, <clears throat> But you know, the, the, I think the point of, of that study, uh, it's, it, I think it was important that there, were, uh, there was a diverse sample. Uh, and, and I think you know, what you would conclude from the study is that for instance, the results in Minnesota were not due simply to the fact that um, that was a less uh, heterogeneous sample or that the results in, uh, from USC were due to the fact that it was a more homogeneous minority sample. So the fact that we have different samples that are geographically distinct, but the results converge on similar conclusions makes it unlikely that the uh, population diversity and differences across the sites uh, were factors in, uh, that affected the conclusion. That being said though, th that question in terms of other things that uh, could be really important to why Hispanic kids in particular uh, might have problems in school or on IQ tests, those are very important questions. Uh, ABCD is designed to have and does have a large Hispanic uh, participation group, a large African-American participation group, and a lot of work went into ABCD to be sensitive to how to work with these families in a way that was appropriate given cultural differences. And, uh, you know, we would hope from ABCD that uh, these kinds of concerns could be addressed much better than we can in these small, smaller local projects that, that we talked about at the end of this presentation.
thank you for for expanding on that in detail. Um, a couple more questions here, and then then we won't keep you any longer. Um, Zena asks, what is the incentive for the participants to remain in the study? Well, they are paid for their participation. Uh, both the child is, is paid, the parents also receive payment. The, you know, we try to develop rapport with the children um, to the extent that we can to maintain the same staff over time, to have the same people recontacting the family. And there are efforts to share broad patterns of findings with the people who are enrolled, hoping that they will see the value to what we're trying to do here. They don't actually get individualized feedback, though, on, for example, um, their cognitive performance or, or things like that. So, so we do appeal quite a bit to their growing interest in science, and we try to make it an enjoyable experience for them. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, Thelma asks, how is the relationship of the parent preference towards a favored twin factored in the increase of use of drugs and decline in IQ? Well, uh, it's not factored in, um, but that would be, uh, you know, again, something that um, we could look at. Uh, and in particular, we could look at this sort of thing uh, in ABCD with its larger uh, sample that's more uh, broadly representative of the entire nation because we have those kinds of uh, questions and we, and we have more twins uh, and we have the singleton sample on top of it, which allows us to address the sample broadly in both twins and singletons. Um, but in the context of you know, our particular investigation, we didn't have the resources at the time that we worked uh, on the IQ study to uh, get into that level of detail. So we haven't done it, but uh, it's a very interesting question and I hope if we were to do this again in five to 10 years, we could answer questions like that. Can I, can I add something oh, or definitely. say something? It's sort of interesting hearing these questions because I, I kind of take it from the nature of the questions that, that it's not an outcome that is easy for a lot of people to digest. Just the idea that maybe it's not a neurotoxic effect of this this drug that is leading to the effect that we see. And so to me, um, it, it really is just an important thing in helping us think about that question related to prevention and how important it is to try to figure this out. Great, great. And, and final question. Um, Jen asks, in your professional opinions, can you speak to the genetic versus environmental impact on substance use in adolescents? For example, is an adult user more likely to have a child who is a user because of the DNA or because of the environment? Complicated, I know. <laughs> okay, well, uh, it is complicated. Uh, it's, it's just, it turns out it's not really um, useful to think about it in terms of it's one or the other. It's always both. Um, what uh, we have, have learned from studying twins and doing behavior genetic research is that, uh, that there is indeed a genetic liability to develop these kinds of problems. And the environment is critically important. One of the ways that we know the environment is critically important is because when you do a twin study, one of the things that you find is that twins are often, identical twins, for instance, are often discordant for the kind of problem that we're interested in. And the only way they can be discordant if it, it, is that the environment is having an effect. So when we look at identical twins and see, for instance, that they're uh, similar in their substance use only about 50% of the time, that means 50% of the time the environment is contributing to their being dissimilar. So one of the great things about twin studies is not just that we learn about the importance of uh, how genetic risk uh, relates to the development of substance use, we also learn that the environment is really important. And in a big study like ABCD, which has so many measures, and as Monica pointed out in her slides, include great measures of environmental risk and uh, the quality of the family life, et cetera, 
you know, we'll be able to start to pinpoint some of these environmental factors that work with genetic risk to produce unfortunate outcomes leading to substance abuse and then hopefully uh, produce protective effects so that even those who are at genetic risk, we can understand how the environment is different for those people who never uh, develop substance abuse despite the risk. So that's the kind of thing that we would, would hope to see in the future. Great question. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed listening to us today. It was great to have this opportunity to share our work with everyone. Thank you. I'd like, on behalf of the Minnesota Center for Chemical and Mental Health, I'd like to thank you all for taking the time to join us today and for submitting all the great questions. And I'd like to extend an extra special thank to doc thank you to Drs. Monica Luciana and Bill Iacono for sharing your time, talents, and findings with us. Oh, oh there's, there's a, if you need to contact us, more info. <laughs> oh, great, great. Please feel free to reach out. Um, at the email you see on your screen that are that will be included in the slides in the email you'll receive here within the next hour, usually about 30 minutes. And I hope everyone has a, a safe and, and fun weekend.